Welcome to Train Signal. You're watching a video about remote access. In this video, we're going to start off by installing the routing and remote access, or simply RAS, component of the network policy and access services role. Now, I say that RAS is just a component of the role. We're going to take a look at the rest of the role in a later video. Once we have RAS installed, we will then configure RAS to go ahead and accept connections from remote clients. Now these connections can either be made via dial-up, which is where we take an old analog 56K modem and dial in through the phone lines. Or these connections can be made via VPN, which is where the client makes their connection via their internet connection. And I will tell you, in today's environment, I'd say probably close to 99% of all remote connectivity is done via VPN. And basically the reason is because high-speed internet has become so cost-effective, you can find it just about anywhere. And so pretty much, why would anybody want to be constricted to a slow connection when they can have the high-speed VPN connection? But we'll take a look at that when we get into the system. Next we'll see how to configure the client to make that connection to the remote access server. Once we have the server and the client all set up and ready to make a connection, we'll then look at how to use network policies to control those connections. And we control them with three different components of the network policy. The first being the conditions. Conditions have to be met to determine which network policy we're going to use. Once we've determined which network policy is going to be used, we then configure a permission as to whether this policy is going to allow connectivity or maybe deny connectivity. And then we have our actual connection restrictions. Now I put over here the word profile because network policies is taking the place of what was previously simply known as remote access policies. Remote access policies have been around since Windows 2000 and pretty much did the same thing as what today's network policies do. But the third component used to be called the profile. So if you've ever worked with remote access policies before, the connection restrictions of the network policies is the same as the profile of the old remote access policy. But anyway, whatever you want to call it, connection restrictions or profile, what it pretty much does is just what it says. I think connection restrictions is a much better term or a more intuitive term because it is just that. It sets restrictions on the connection. We'll look at what some of those restrictions are. And then after all that, we'll take a quick overview look at what radius is. All right, well, we have a lot to do here, so let's go ahead and get started and connect with one of our servers. Okay, now for this lesson, we are going to go ahead and connect with our New York member one member server. And it is significant that we're using a member server because you don't want any server that's going to touch the outside world to be a domain controller, unless it has to be, unless you're in a single server environment. And in this case, we are going to be a remote access server, which does touch the outside world. So we're going to go with the member server. Now, before we connect, I do have to tell you, if you're following along, and if you are using remote desktop like I am here, I want to give you the heads up that you could run into some connectivity issues along the way. I may have them here as well. Maybe yes, maybe no. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. And basically what it comes down to is when configuring routing and remote access, we're going to be manipulating the network. And that manipulation, depending on exactly what we do with it, can cause us to lose our remote desktop connection. If you do lose it, don't worry, just pause the video. You should be able to regain connectivity, and then once you get your connection back, then you can go ahead and resume the video. Or if necessary, just go ahead and go to the actual machine. Don't use it via remote desktop. All right, let's go ahead and connect to New York member one now. Hey, one other quick side note while we're connecting. If you had reduced the amount of memory in this server for the last video, you're going to want to put that memory back again. I have done so on my machine here. All right, now that we're on New York member one, the first thing we want to do 
is we want to go ahead and install the RS component of the network policy and access services role. So let's go ahead and click on start and go to server manager. Of course, that's where we add all our roles. Go ahead and click on roles. And then we're going to click on add roles. And then right down here, you'll find network policy and access services. Go ahead and check that box and then click next. As always, we get our introduction screen as to exactly what network policy and access services are. Go ahead and click on next. And now we get to choose exactly which services we want to install. And so what I'm going to do is go ahead and click on routing and remote access services. And you'll see here that that gives us the ability to provide remote access. It also gives us the ability to do routing. And you may remember from the routing video that we had used this exact same role to turn the machine into a router. So I'm going to go ahead and uncheck the box for routing because all we care about right now is the remote access service component. So we'll go ahead and click on next. And then here's a confirmation of what we're about to do. Go ahead and click on install. And now the component will install. Now this does take a couple minutes depending on the speed of your machine. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the video and I'll be right back with you as soon as it's done. All right, we're back. And you'll see here that the installation has succeeded. So let's go ahead and close out of the wizard and go ahead and close out of our server manager because now that we have installed routing and remote access, we now have to go configure it. So let's go ahead and click on start, administrative tools, and you'll see here there's now an entry for routing and remote access. Now the routing and remote access utility is something that really is pretty much the same thing as it's been in Windows Server 2003 and Windows 2000. So if you've worked with it before, you should still be pretty familiar with it. In each version of Windows, Microsoft attempts to make it a little bit more intuitive to change some of the wording to make things be a little bit more obvious. But otherwise, it's pretty much the same thing. And what we have to do first is, well, you'll notice this red down arrow here. Well, that means that it's not configured. So in order to configure it, you right click on the server and select configure and enable routing and remote access. In the routing remote access server setup wizard, here's a welcome screen. Go ahead and click on next. And then here's the configuration screen where they build in a few common configurations. We can choose to be a remote access server, dial up or VPN, and that is what we're going to do right now. We could do network address translation or NAT, which is where you can allow everybody on the inside to connect through this server to the outside world via a single public IP address. You could set up both a VPN and NAT, or you could create just a secure connection between two private networks, or you could just create a custom configuration altogether if you don't like any of the four choices. Now we're going to go ahead and say that we want to be a remote access server. So let's go ahead and click on next. Now we have to choose what type of remote access server we want to be. Do we want to be a VPN server? and or do we want to be a dial-up server. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to only check the dial-up checkbox. And the reason why is because I want to show you that even configuring the machine as a dial-up server, you still automatically have some VPN connection capabilities. So I'm going to go ahead and select dial-up and then we'll actually come back and do VPN just to show you the difference. So here's dial up. Let's go ahead and click on next. Now in this case, I have more than one network adapter on the computer. So I need to pick which one we're going to accept connections through. And I'm going to go ahead and take my main local area connection, which is on the 192.168.10 network. Go ahead and click on next. Matter of fact, local area connection two has been disabled on this computer. I'm going to go ahead and click next. Now we have to decide how we want IP addresses to be assigned not to this computer, but to the clients coming into this computer. Because one of the things you really need to understand is that if somebody is either at home or let's say at a remote office and they want to VPN into this network, 
they are going to be coming in via an outside network. So they're not going to have an IP address for our network. Okay, and that's really what remote access is all about. It's about somebody remotely making a connection to our internal network. And that's really what remote access is. It's about somebody from the outside becoming part of the internal network. So we have two choices here. If we have a DHCP server running on the network, then we can go ahead and leave it at automatically. And that means that the remote access server will go out to the DHCP server and get an IP address to then give out to the clients. Now, if you don't have a DHCP server, then you can actually create a specified range of IP addresses. So I have a DHCP server running, but just to show you, let's select from a specified range of addresses. Go ahead and click on next. And now we can add the actual range assignment. So I'll click on new. I'm going to actually give a completely different range of IP addresses, something that is not part of our actual network here. I want it to stand out when we look at the IP configuration later. So let's put in 10.10.10.1 through 10.10.10. Well, let's go ahead and put 100. Okay, so that would allow for 100 addresses to be handed out. I'll go ahead and click OK. Now that may not make complete sense to you right now, but it will once we make our connection because we'll take a look at this. So we're going to say hypothetically that our internal network is 10.10.10. .10. That's the network that we're on. All right, now that we have our address range, let's go ahead and click on Next. Now we have the choice as to whether we are going to manage multiple remote access servers through something called radius. Now radius is something I'll go over with you at the end of this video, but the the quick sum up is basically you can manage multiple remote access servers with a single radius server. If this remote access server was going to participate with a radius server, then you would click yes. But in this case, we are not. We only have the one remote access server. We'll manage it in place, so I'm going to leave it on no and go ahead and click on next and then here is your confirmation screen and click finish now when we do we see a little really just I don't know how much of it's a warning message is just much of a, an information message and it talks about the relaying of DHCP messages and what it really has to do with is as a remote access server I am basically acting as a form of a router and since DHCP can't be relayed through a router, in order to get additional DHCP components like default gateway, DNS servers, Win servers, and, and things like that, all the additional DHCP options, we would have to install a DHCP relay agent on this server as well to go ahead and relay those messages. If you don't, it'll still work because this server will go out and get the IP addresses on behalf of the client, but the client won't get the default gateway, DNS servers, Win servers, and things like that unless you install a DHCP relay agent. Now, as it turns out, none of that matters to this scenario because we're not using DHCP. We used a custom list of IP addresses that we want to hand out. So I'll go ahead and click OK to the message. And you'll see here that it's asking us to wait a moment while the services configure and start and boom, they've finished. And so we'll go ahead and, oh, there we go. Now it's actually finished. And now you'll notice that we have the green up arrow signifying that this has been configured. Matter of fact, over here, you'll see routing remote access is configured on this server. Let me go ahead and put away IP version six there. The main thing that I want to show you right now is the ports area of this particular configuration. Because for right now, there are no VPN ports visible. But as I mentioned before, as a remote access server, even though we configured ourselves for dial up, we actually still have VPN capabilities. And so I want to show you how you would go in and set that up. 
The way you would do that is by right clicking on ports and going to properties. Now when you go into properties, you'll see here that we have PPTP, L2TP, and SSTP. These are the three VPN protocols that can be used. So what you want to do is select a VPN protocol that you want to use and each one has its benefits. Basically PPTP is the oldest. I would say it's the least secure but it's still quite secure and it's a very good protocol and quite frankly by setting it up you allow connectivity from almost any type of client out there. Whereas if you use L2TP or SSTP you're restricted on newer clients that have the capabilities of supporting those protocols. So for right now, let's pick PPTP and select configure. Now you'll notice that by default, there are five ports already set up. But in order to allow connectivity to those ports, you have to determine whether you want to give remote access connectivity and or if you want to be able to do demand dial routing. Now, demand dial routing is where you set up a remote access server in two different offices and you have those two offices point to each other. So basically you have them both acting as a VPN server and a VPN client so that one office can reach the other office. For right now, we're just looking at remote access connections, so we'll clear that checkbox. Now, as I said before, there is a maximum number of ports of five by default. And what that means is this server will accept as many as five internal VPN connections the way we're currently configured. If that's not enough, if I need more, I could go ahead and change this. So let's change that to 10 maximum ports. Now I'll support up to 10 connections simultaneously. So I'll go ahead and click OK. And you'll notice that PPTP has gone to 10, although the other two still sit at 5. Click OK once again. And now you'll see that I have the 10 PPTP ports ready to go. Now, believe it or not, that's it. I am configured as a VPN server. Although that may be all we have to do to set up a VPN server, there are some other things that we may want to do to set this machine up as a VPN server. So before we go into anything else, let's go ahead and, you know, we just saw how easy it was to set up the server. Let's see how easy it is to set up a client. So the first thing we need to do is minimize our New York member server. And now we need to connect with a client. Now the client I would like to use here is, I'm going to use Chicago XP1 because it would be quite typical to have a client out in Chicago who might need to remote in to the New York office. So let's go ahead and connect to Chicago XP1. All right, we're now logged into Chicago XP1. And what we want to do on Windows XP is go ahead and click on Start. Now, what I like to do is I like to either put network connections or put my network places on the Start menu. But you'll notice I don't have it here. So what we have to do is go into the control panel. And then here you'll see network and internet connections. And then we can go to network connections. Now that we're looking at our network connections, what we want to do is create a new connection. In the new connection wizard, we'll go ahead and click on next. We need to choose, well, what type of connection we want to make. Well, here we have connect to the network at my workplace using either dial-up or VPN. So I'll select that one and click next. Now, are we going to dial into the network or are we going to go via VPN? We're going to go ahead and connect via VPN. We don't have a modem here, which by the way, I'll show you when we get back to the server. But that's why even though we set up for a dial-up remote access server, we really didn't have anything to configure. There is no modem on this computer. I'll show you where one would show up if you have one. All right, so virtual private network connection, click next. Now we need to give it a name. Now it says company name here. Really all you're doing is naming this connection. So we'll just say main office. And you'll see where that comes into play in just a moment. Click on next. 
Now you need to put in the IP address of the remote access VPN server that you're going to connect to. And in this case, it was 192.168.10.100. That is the IP address on the network that I set up as the VPN server. Click Next. Now we can choose whether we want this to be for myself or anyone who logs in. It really doesn't matter for the sake of this lesson, but that would be for just what it says there. If you want to set this up for only the user who's currently logged in or for everyone. We'll go ahead and leave it as my use only. Click Next. And now, other than choosing whether we want to add a shortcut on our desktop, we can go ahead and finish. Now when we finish, it will assume you want to make a connection. But I'm going to go ahead and hit cancel. Just because I wanted to show you, here is where we have our main office. And here we have a PPTP VPN connection. Now let's go into the properties of this connection. And let's see what we want to do. Here's the IP address that we're going to connect to. If you need to make another connection first, as a for instance, let's say you had to make your connection to the internet first in order to then do your VPN, then you would check the box and make another connection first. But in this case, we don't have to. We're already on the internet. And again, in today's world, typically, most machines are always on the internet. Now, under the Options tab, one of the main checkboxes that I want to use here is include the Windows Logon domain. And that's because you need to determine what domain the user is going to log on to when they connect. And you'll see that in just a moment when it asks us for our credentials. Now here we have some additional stuff like redial attempts and how much time between attempts. This has to do with if you don't make a connection right away. Security is where we can go ahead and set up some additional security features that we're not going to really get into right now. Really where these would come into play is under advanced. If you want to go into some custom settings, click on settings you could actually determine the specific authentication protocol you want to use. We're not going to get into that right now. So right now we're just going to leave it at typical. And I will tell you, if you're actually functioning in a Microsoft environment where you have a Microsoft VPN server and a Microsoft client, the defaults are perfect. I mean, that's no accident. Microsoft <laughs> set that up so that everything would automatically configure itself appropriately. So let's move over to networking. And in here is basically where you can pick what type of VPN. So if I wanted to switch this over to L2TP instead of PPTP, I could do that because this operating system does support L2TP. But we'll go ahead and leave it at automatic. If we needed to do any additional TCP IP configuration, there is the opportunity to do it here. Although again, typically you would do that separately. It should already be in place. And on advanced, you can configure your Windows firewall if you need to in order to make this connection. And you could also allow what's called internet connection sharing. And what this is, is basically once I make the connection to my remote access server, anybody that's on the same network with me, the client, can now share that VPN connection into the network. And this is actually something that is practiced by a lot of small companies where you just take one machine and you set it up as a VPN client, connecting over to a VPN server in another office, and then you share it so that everybody within your office can make that connection. It was really designed for internet sharing, as in if I were connected to the internet, everybody could connect to the internet through me, but it works just as well with VPN. All right, so that's our properties, so let's go ahead and click OK. Now I will tell you, that's the way a VPN client connection looks in Windows XP and it's going to be slightly different depending on what client you're using. If you were using Windows 2000 Professional it would look a little bit different and if you were using Vista it would look a little bit different. Basically Windows 2000 Professional would probably have less features and, and less support because it's an older operating system and Vista is going to have a couple of new features and a little bit newer support. As a, for instance if you have Vista with Service Pack 1 it, you can actually support the SSTP VPN protocol. But otherwise, it all works pretty much the same. So now, if I go ahead and either double click on this or I can right click and select connect, either way, it now prompts us for credentials. And this is where I'll talk about that checkbox right here where it says domain. This is where we get to choose what domain we're logging into. 
So I'm going to go ahead and set up the user administrator, put in my password, and we're going to put in the Globomantics domain. So we want the administrator, the all-powerful administrator, to go ahead and remote access in from Chicago. Okay, so the administrator has flown out to Chicago, wants to connect back to the main office in New York. I could choose to save this username and password so that I don't have to keep entering it. If I don't save it, then every time I go to connect, it's going to prompt me for these credentials. Saving it really all comes down to do you feel that you have a secure enough environment that these credentials can be saved and therefore can be a convenience that to not have to type them in? Or do you need to be of a more secure nature and not save them so that you have to type them in every time? I will tell you that in many, many environments, I would recommend not saving the username and password. Make the users have to enter their credentials. Matter of fact, if you are using additional third-party VPN appliances, which is what most companies actually do, you would configure that appliance to require those credentials anyway. But for right now, I'm going to go ahead and save the credentials just to make this easier as we connect through different attempts. Okay, so let's go ahead and click on connect and see what happens. And you'll see here that it did make the connection. It went by very, very quickly, but it made the connection with the server. But when verifying the username and password, this account does not have permission to dial in. Uh-oh. Well, guess what? Even though I am trying to remote access in as the administrator, right? I mean, the administrator should be able to get everywhere at any time. Well, by default, nobody gets in, okay? Until we make a change in our network or on our remote access server, nobody gets in. Now, the first thing I'm going to show you is how to manually let users in just going user by user and you'll hear you'll see here it's going to keep trying to redial so I'm going to hit cancel minimize our Chicago XP1 client and now let's go ahead and connect to New York DC1 now the reason we're connecting to our domain controller is because we need to go into active directory to individually control users access so what we want to do on our domain controller is click start Administrative Tools, Active Directory, Users, and Computers. In Active Directory, we want to go ahead and find our user that we want to give access to. So I'll click on Users, and then here's the Administrator. If we double-click to go into the properties of the Administrator account, you'll see that there is a Dial-In tab. Now on the Dial-In tab, this is where we can choose to either allow access deny access okay so that's if you want to manually grant or take away access from individual users and I will tell you by the way back in the days of Windows NT that was the only choice we had it was either you know you can have it you can't you can't you can you can't yet can. one by one as of Windows 2000 we introduced remote access policies and now with server 2008 we now call them network policies so the default you'll see here was control access through NPS network policy and the network policies which we'll look at in just a moment by default deny everyone so let's go ahead and allow the administrator access to the network so we'll go ahead and click OK minimize New York DC1 go back into Chicago XP1 now before we connect again I want to show you one other thing Let's go ahead and click on start and then go to our command prompt. Now, if you don't have command prompt on the menu right here, you can click run and then type in CMD and hit OK. In Windows XP, that's how you get into your command prompt. The reason I want to go into the command prompt is because I want to show you, I'm going to do IP config. I want to show you that right now we have one IP address and that's 192.168. Dot ten dot two twenty two okay and I want you to keep that in mind because we're gonna come back to this in just a moment now let's make our connection now you'll notice it remembered all of our information because we told it to save 
So let's click connect and see what happens. Now we make it a connection. We got through the registration, verified username and password, and you'll see right here it says main office is now connected. Cool, we're now connected to the main office. Now I'm gonna go ahead and go back to our command prompt and I'm gonna do another IP config command. And the reason why is I wanna show you that we now have two IP addresses. We have 192.168.10.222, which we had all along, but then we also have 10.10.10.2, which is one of the 100 addresses that we set aside. This is the PPP adapter, the point-to-point -point protocol adapter, meaning the remote access network adapter that's been virtually created. This is the IP address that I would use to go ahead and navigate the main office's network. Now, just to make sure you're not confused, yes, I know that the New York office also shares this 192.168.10 network, but I really wanted you to be able to see the drastic difference with another IP address. All right, so our client connected. Let's go ahead and close our command prompt window. And now what I wanna do is go ahead and go back to the remote access server, minimize Chicago XP1, go back to New York member one, and let's do the same thing. Let's click start and go to a command prompt, do an IP config. And you'll see here that we have 192.168.10.100, which we had all along, but we also now have a PPP adapter as well. This is the dial-in interface or the incoming interface, which is 10.10.10.1. That's why the client got that too, is because the server always takes the first IP address in the range that we're handing out so as to be able to communicate with the clients because it's almost like it's a separate network that we're connecting on. All right, so that kind of proves that we've made our connection. We'll close the command prompt window here. Now, the next thing we need to do is we need to go ahead and talk about these network policies because going into our domain controller and having manual control over who can get in and who can't get in is ridiculous. If you have hundreds and thousands of users, you're not gonna wanna go to each one individually. So let's go ahead and go back to our domain controller. I'll minimize our member server here. Go back to the domain controller. Let's go back into administrator. Go to the dial-in tab. And let's put it back to control access through the network policy. Click OK. And we can go ahead and pretty much close out of here. I'll minimize it just in case we need to come back. But we're pretty much done with our domain controller. Let's go back to our XP client. You'll see we're still connected. Once the connection is made, controlling through policy is not going to force that connection to end. So we need to go ahead and disconnect to prove that we have indeed taken away access from the administrator. Let's go ahead and try connecting again. And you'll see here that when you're verifying username and password, it says, I do not have permission to dial in. So let's cancel minimize our client and go back to our New York member one server. Now here's where we run into something that has changed a little bit from the previous versions of this utility. In Windows 2000 or server 2003, if you had an individual remote access server, you would go ahead and manage your remote access policies from within this utility. And if you had multiple remote access servers and you wanted to have a policy to control all of them, then you would need to implement something called IAS, which stands for Internet Authentication Services. Now this was a separate utility and a separate service that had to be installed and configured, whereas now in Windows Server 2008, let me go ahead and expand this over to the right just a little bit. You'll see here are your remote access logging and policies. And if I go to it, well, there's nothing there. In order to work with it, you have to right click and launch NPS, Network Policy Server Services, which took the place of IAS. And NPS is already, just like that, installed and ready to be configured. So if I click on Network Policies, you'll see here that there are 
two that are there by default. The red circle with the X in it is because they are a deny access policy. And basically what I can tell you is these default policies, you know what they say? They say unless the user has been given explicit allow credentials, don't let anybody in. And that's why by default nobody gets in. But when I gave the administrator account the permissions to get in through the individual account in Active Directory, I was able to get in because that's how these are set up. These are the defaults. What we're going to do is set up our own policy. So let's right click on Network Policies and select New. Now we need to give this policy a name. So let's call this Administrator's Control. Now, I was going to name it Allow Administrators, but I'm going to call it Administrators Control, and I'm going to show you that we can make this either allow or deny, depending on what it is that we want to do with our administrators. Down here, we need to specify what type of connection. You'll see here that it's unspecified. Uh, by default, you can pick a terminal server gateway, remote access server, DHCP server, health registration authority, or HCAP server. Now, we'll get into some of that a little bit later when we're talking about overall network access protection. But right now, we're going to go into the remote access server. Now, let's go ahead and click on Next. Now, this is where we get into the three areas that I mentioned at the beginning of this video. The first thing we need to do is specify conditions. Now, the conditions have to do with conditions that are met in order to implement this policy. So these are not conditions of the connection or restrictions to the connection itself. It's a condition that has to be met so as to determine that we're going to even use this policy. So let me click on Add to create a condition. And what we want to do is we're going to pick Windows Groups and click Add. And now we need to pick what group, so I'll click Add Groups, and I'm going to put in Domain Admins, check names, there we go, Domain Admins, click OK. So now we're saying that we've added the Windows Group Domain Admins from the Global Mantics domain, click OK. And that's our condition. So what that means is if somebody is trying to connect into this remote access server, and they are a member of the domain admins group then they go ahead and meet the condition so we will use this policy now next we need to set up a permission to the policy do we want this policy to grant access or deny access so let's go ahead and grant access for right now now we can also determine whether we want access to be determined by the user dial-in properties which would then override this policy or not. Okay, so if we say access is determined by the dial-in properties, that means we could still go ahead and allow an individual to have their dial-in tab in Active Directory grant them permissions. Or we could take that away and say no. If you are part of this particular policy, then you're going to have to meet whatever stipulations this policy puts in place. All right, let's go ahead and click on Next because we're going to leave it as Access Granted. Click on Next. This is where we have what used to be called the Profile, whereas now we have Connection Specifics or sometimes Connection Restrictions. And in this case, first of all, we're going to set up what authentication methods we are willing to accept. Now here you'll notice that we're using MS CHAP and CHAP v2. So that's Microsoft's version of the Challenge Handshake Allocation Protocol. We could also choose to support the old original non-Microsoft CHAP authentication protocol. And this would be if you wanted to be somewhat secure but had a non-Microsoft client. Or you could go to the unsecure authentication protocol of PAP and SPAP. These days I, I can't even think of a scenario where I've seen SPAP and, and PAP used at all. And then up here we have EAP, the Extensible Authentication Protocol, which pretty much has to do with if you're using something other than just 
username and password. If you're using some form of multi-factor authentication, like a smart card, then you would go ahead and you would enter in an EAP type to conform to the specific multi-factor authentication that you're using. Now for right now, since we're working with Microsoft and Microsoft, right, a Microsoft server and a Microsoft client, we'll leave MSChap and MSChap v2 as our authentication methods. Click on next. Now we have additional constraints and that's where we can say idle timeout value. So if somebody connects into our network and then they walk away from their machine, that might be a security issue. It may also tie up resources that don't need to be tied up. So we could go ahead and say, hey, you know what? If the system sits idle for 15 minutes, kick them out. Now we can also do a session timeout, which is just a flat out maximum session time. We may have more users who want to come in than we do connection capabilities. And so we may have to limit how long any given user can come in. So we might say, hey, you know what? If you're connected, I'm gonna give you an hour and then I'm gonna kick you out. Now you could try to come back in again, but if someone else got in before you, you're gonna to have to wait your turn. You can set up caller ID if you only want to allow connectivity from a certain location. You can set up day and time restrictions. So you could say, hey, you know what? I'm only gonna allow you to connect during certain days and certain times. And you can set up a certain network access port type to say, hey, I'm only going to let you come in via these specific types of connections. So there's a number of constraints that we can put on this connection. And I will tell you, although the interface has changed, this is all the same information that we used to do in our old remote access policy profiles. So let's go ahead and click on next. And now we can get a little more specific with some more of our network access protection, we could go into, uh, here's multi-link and bandwidth allocation protocol. So this is if you are using dial-up and you wanna use multi-link, which is multiple dial-in lines at a time, you can do that. Here you have IP filters. If you wanna put a filter as to specific IP ranges that can and cannot get in. Here you have encryption. Here's where you determine what level of encryption you support. And you notice we support anything. So even if somebody's not encrypted, we're going to let them in. If that's not acceptable, if we, if we want to say, no, 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 you need to be using 128-bit encryption or stronger, or you're not getting in, then we can select to do so. But in this case, we're going to go ahead and accept everything, especially since we're using the old PPTP protocol for right now. And let's go ahead and click on Next. And here you'll see you get your confirmation screen, which is saying that, hey, we need to go ahead and be a member of the domain admins group of the Global Mantics domain to go ahead and even use this policy. And then here we have certain authentication methods we can use. And this is kind of out of order, in my opinion. Access permissions should be on top because that's really what's next is the fact that we're granting access as opposed to denying access and then once we've decided we're going to grant access now we can do it based upon only certain authentication methods and then other restrictions that we've put in place okay and there's a number of them most specifically we in this case we configured some timeout values all right so let's go ahead and click on finish and you'll see here that we now have an additional policy and it says administrators control now it's very important that you set the order of your remote access policies up correctly. And the reason why is because that conditions portion, once that has been met on a specific remote access policy, no other policy will be looked at. So if a user were to VPN in and they were a member of the Global Mantics domain admins, they will have met the conditions of this first policy and these two will be ignored. So it really doesn't matter what they say. If somebody else who is not a domain admin were to go ahead and connect in, they would not meet the conditions of this particular policy. So it would go down to the next policy and then ask if they meet those conditions. And if they don't meet those, then they go to this policy. And if they meet these, you'll notice that this one is the catch all day and time restrictions is the condition. 
and it says that basically they're calling and if, if I had more of a win, uh, of a screen here this would be Sunday through I don't know if you can see it it popped up here Sunday through all the way through Saturday from midnight to midnight meaning 24 7 that's the condition that's the catch-all so because that's the catch-all if we were to go ahead and move this up to the top any other policy that we create after that wouldn't matter and the reason it wouldn't matter is because these conditions would be met before any other conditions had an opportunity to be met and as soon as the conditions are met on one policy that's the one that's used nothing else is looked at so let's go ahead and move that back down again and now that we've put this in place this administrators control in place and it's allowing access let's see if it worked so let's minimize our member server let's go back to our Chicago client now remember the last time we tried to connect it didn't work let's double click we have our credentials click connect we're in we're connected it worked now let's go ahead and disconnect and let's try something here let's try connecting again but this time let's put in the password and let's say we want to be the administrator of the North America domain and click connect and you'll notice that this account does not have permission to dial in and the reason why is because this is the domain administrator for the North America domain not the global mantics domain so let's cancel out of there and that's pretty much how this all works now the one last thing I want to show you before we wrap up this video is something that I promised you we'd come back to. So let me go ahead and minimize Chicago XP1, go back to our New York member one member server, and we'll close out of our network policy server. And in routing and remote access, I want to go ahead and disable routing and remote access. Go ahead and click yes. And the reason I'm disabling this is because I told you that when we did the original setup, that we set it up as a dial-in server, and I would show you what's different when you set it up as a true VPN server. So let me go ahead and right-click and configure it once again. See how easy that was to just clean house and start over? This is so cool. Let me click on Next. Again, we're going to say we're a remote access server. Click Next. But this time we're going to pick VPN. Now one thing that I'm going to show you right here that changes right away is this checkbox. Enable security on the selected interface by setting up static packet filters. And it says right here that these filters will only allow VPN traffic to gain access to the server through this interface. Now be careful when you're doing this, especially if you're doing it via a remote desktop connection because this one will actually kill the connection. And that was part of why I gave you that heads up early on in the video. So we're going to clear this checkbox. We know what it does, but we're going to go ahead and clear that for right now. Click Next. Automatically or arrange, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to leave it at automatically because I want to get to what we're trying to show you. Next. You'll notice, by the way, that when I click Next, it doesn't ask me for a range of IP addresses. That's what's different because we said automatically, so the IP addresses will come from the DHCP server. Again, we're not going to configure use with a uh, radius server, so click Next and Finish. Here's our message about DHCP relaying. Click OK. And it'll take just a moment here while the services install and, and start. And now they are done. Window will clear out in just a moment here. All right. The main thing I wanted to show you that has changed is right here where it says Ports. You will notice that, first of all, we actually have all the ports already configured without having to go in and choosing to configure them. Whereas when we set it up as a dial-in server, we had to go in and actually specifically ask for the ports. The other thing I want you to notice is how many of them there are. If I right-click and go to the properties, I now have 128 connections supported for each of the three VPN protocols. So that's a lot of connections that we can support instantaneously if we choose to set up as a VPN server out the gates. 
So that is the way you would typically do it if you know that you're definitely going to be a VPN server and you know that you're going to have a lot of VPN connections coming in. All right, now the other thing I told you I, I would come back to is if you have a modem. If you have a modem, then it will appear on this list. It's right in this window under ports. That's where you would see the modem come into play when you were setting up dial-up. All right, now the one last thing I want to show you is I'm going to expand IP version 4 here. And then you'll notice right here is your DHCP relay agent to be configured if you wanted to go ahead and have DHCP pass through all of its DHCP options. I show you how to set up that relay agent back in the DHCP video. Go back there if you don't remember how to do it, but it's, it's, it's pretty intuitive. Now one last thing I want to go over with you before we wrap up this video, and that is something called RADIUS. So what is RADIUS? Well, RADIUS stands for Remote Authentication Dial-In User Service, or <laughs> at least that's what the letters stand for, R-A-D-I-U-S. But really, what, what is RADIUS? Well, RADIUS allows for centralized management of remote access connectivity. So if you're in a larger environment where you have multiple remote access servers and you want to keep centralized control over all the activity, you would do so by implementing a RADIUS server. Now, RADIUS has two different areas of management. One area is accounting, or what's sometimes just simply known as logging. And it is just that. It's keeping a log of everyone who remotely connects into the network, regardless of what remote access server they hit. And it keeps a complete log of who, what, when, where, why, and how. Or we could say how long that they've connected. Now this is something that you can do on an individual remote access server as well. But RADIUS allows control over all your servers in one location. Now the other half is authentication. Just a few minutes ago, I showed you how to set up network policies on a remote access server. Well, a RADIUS server would give you the ability to set up network policies that would control authentication over all your remote access servers in one central location. Now, I will tell you that the way RADIUS was used years ago is a little bit different than how it's used today. Years ago, the primary use for RADIUS was to allow for users who were traveling away from the company and had to connect in to be able to do so by dialing in to their local ISP, which is Internet Service Provider. In other words, before we had high-speed Internet everywhere and people just really had to dial in with a good old-fashioned analog modem, the problem was is you might have hundreds of users out there, but you don't want to have hundreds of modems and hundreds of phone lines set up to accommodate them. So what you would have all your users do is dial into their own ISP who already was set up with all the modem banks necessary and then the ISP would go ahead and connect to your RADIUS server over a single connection and very often it would be a single high-speed connection that you would have with the ISP and then validate internally within your network with your domain controllers to make sure that that user was allowed in you would pass that back to the ISP and the ISP would let your remote user in well dial-up connectivity is pretty much a thing of the past so the way we use radius today is really for nothing more than this centralized management to be able to control more than one remote access server or keep track of more than one remote access server in a centralized location. All right, well, we've done quite a bit in this video, so after watching this, you should know how to, well, first of all, install and configure a remote access server. And I have to tell you something. I don't know if you noticed, but everything was pretty much wizard-driven and was, I don't know, I thought pretty intuitive. And that's pretty cool, because Back in the days of Windows NT, I'll tell you what, I used to run as fast and as far away as I could from remote access configurations. It used to be so manual and so difficult, and there were so many problems that I just didn't want to have anything to do with it. 
Whereas now, with all of these wizards and the way Microsoft has set everything up, if you're going to be in a smaller network and you don't want to go out and get some additional third-party VPN appliance, you can actually set this up with a couple of simple clicks in Windows Server 2008. Now, not only is configuring the server easy, but we also configured the client through a nice simple wizard. And I'll tell you what, we looked at Windows XP, but it doesn't matter if it's an older client or if it's a newer client. They all use very intuitive, simple wizards to set up connectivity. And then the last thing, this is probably the one thing that you want to spend most of your time familiarizing yourself with, is the use of network policies so that you can have control over who gets in and when they get in, how they get in. All right, well, that's pretty much it for remote access. I'll see you in the next video.